care, lovely. If you want to, <laughs> I'm easy. <laughs> this, is, this is why I, I don't, ind I don't indulge before I talk. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're going to start the afternoon session with our director, Susan Neiman, who um, is here to talk about the development of a rationale of why the U.S. dropped the bomb post-war. Um, and in addition to being our director, she has written widely from Kant and Evil to most recently a book about what the Anglo world can learn from the Germans uh, when it comes to coming to terms with past national atrocities. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. So, I'm not at all an expert on these topics, <clears throat> and the story I'm going to tell um, is probably known by Robert and possibly by Lovely as well, but it's one that an astonishing number of people don't know. Um, the talk is based on an essay I wrote a few years ago as an exercise in American, Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, which is a German word roughly translated as working off or working through the past, I'd been approached by a journal that was planning to uh, uh, issue a volume to coincide with the 70th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki asking the question, why has critical theory or philosophy more generally devoted so much time to reflecting on Auschwitz and so little time on Hiroshima? And of course, it wasn't only uh, philosophy, it's also popular culture. When I was writing, I looked around for movies on the Second World War in the Pacific and was stunned by how few there are in comparison to how m many films have been made about the war in the European theater. Um, this is a topic we might want to discuss later if you choose. Uh, I thought the journal was asking an excellent question, and even though I didn't know who they were, <clears throat> I agreed to write something thinking it would be simple. Uh, I'd look at what I knew were the few philosophical pieces on the subject. I had a couple of ideas, and the whole thing would be over in uh, two or three weeks until I made the mistake from the point of view of timing to do a little empirical reading. My beliefs about what happened on August 6th, 1945, were quite settled and common, roughly, after more or less informed deliberation, Truman decided to drop the bomb to end the war without an American invasion of Japan that would have count, uh, cost countless lives. Now, those of us whose natural political instincts turn to the left regret the decision as woefully short-sighted, uh, for an opening the atomic age, it initiated an arms race that, as we know, could still destroy the planet. We also question the assumption that the lives of American soldiers have more weight than the lives of Japanese civilians, even as we acknowledge the political forces that make such a calculation seem self-evident. Was the decision affected by racism or simply a matter of every nation's tendency to put its citizens first whether they're soldiers or civilians. Either way, we're inclined to condemn Truman for taking a step in the history of warfare that can't be undone. It's worth remembering that when Picasso painted Guernica, the aerial bombing of women and children was considered outrageous, just that. Less than a decade later, the firebombing of Tokyo, which killed more civilians immediately than the bombing of Hiroshima, would be regarded as perfectly normal warfare. At the time, Hiroshima seemed to be part of a continuum. Uh, now we know that the use of nuclear weapons marked a qualitative difference that should never have been permitted. Now this is the view that I held along with most of the informed and conscientious Americans I know. It's a view that was expressed with his usual clarity by John Rawls in an essay written to mark the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima for the magazine Descent. Rawls argued that there are situations in which nations might legitimately attack civilians by aerial bombing, such as the months when Britain faced Nazi Germany's superior military power alone since, and I quote, the crucial matter is that under no condition could Germany be allowed to win the war? 
But such crisis conditions did not hold in 1945, <coughs> so that Rawls concluded both Hiroshima and the firebombing of Japanese cities were great evils, not a word that Rawls used uh, lightly, that the duties of statemanship require political leaders to avoid in the absence of the crisis exemption. Among those who knew Rawls's biography, uh, this essay was rightly, in my view, seen as evidence of his own moral character. He was a soldier in the Pacific, um, and as such, his was one of the lives that might have been lost in an invasion of the home islands. Even nobler, or more Kantian if you like, was his refusal to mention that fact or to allow Michael Walzer, the editor of Dissent at the time, to include it in a biographical note. The attempt to base moral judgments on reasons and to avoid any hint of pathos or self-righteousness was a hallmark of Rawls' writing. Now, Rawls' position on Hiroshima was undoubtedly a moral one, <coughs> and moral judgments must often be made without complete knowledge of the facts. Yet his perpetuation of the myths surrounding Hiroshima is characteristic of a standpoint that usually mars even the best philosophical work. And here is his summary of the reasons Hiroshima was bombed. And I quote, the bomb was dropped to hasten the end of the war. It is clear that Truman and most other allied leaders thought it would do that. Another reason was that it would save lives where the lives counted are the lives of American soldiers. The lives of Japanese military or civilian presumably counted less. Here the calculations of least time and most lives saved were mutually supporting. The last reason I mention is that the bomb was dropped to impress the Russians with American power and make them more agreeable with our demands. This reason is highly disputed, but urged by some critics and scholars as important. I also believe this could have been done at little cost and further casualties. An invasion was unnecessary at that date. However, and this is underlined, whether that is true or not makes no difference. Without the crisis exemption, these bombings were great evils. Now, what's striking in this discussion is the philosopher's carefully agnostic attitude towards the events which led to Hiroshima. Some critics and scholars view the desire to impress the Soviet Union as important. I also believe an invasion was unnesessary. Well, I share Rawls's conclusion that the decision to drop the bomb was wrong, whatever the facts turn out to be. I'm disturbed by his desire to stand above the historical fray. For in doing so, he barely leaves a scratch on the picture that was very deliberately created at the behest of James Conant, president of Harvard and member of the interim committee created to advise Truman on the use of nuclear arms. In a telling letter written in September 1946, that is over a year um, after the bomb was dropped, Conant said, few Americans criticized the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Polls confirmed that conclusion. At the time, 85% of Americans surveyed approved of the decision, and 22 thought the US should have attacked Japan with even more atomic weapons. But John Hersey's widely read New Yorker report on the aftermath of the bombing, as well as a protest written by many of the scientists who were involved in the Manhattan Project, was beginning to create doubt. A small minority, wrote Conant, if it represents the type of person who is both sentimental and verbally minded and in contact with our youth could create a distortion of history. I.e. sentimental, verbally minded, in contact with our youth, that is anybody who teaches, I suppose. This type of sentimentalism, Conant continued, for so I regard it as bound to have a great deal of influence on the next generation. The type of person who goes into teaching, particularly school teaching, will be influenced a great deal by this type of argument, end quote. To preclude that influence, Conant persuaded Henry Stimson to write an article that appeared in the February 1947 issue of Harper's Magazine. Stimson, a Republican who'd been Secretary of War from 1940 to 45, was an ideal choice for the task. Writing his memoirs in retirement, he commanded respect across party lines. Stimson's essay had consequences any academic 
would envy, it was almost solely responsible for creating the legend that most Americans, and indeed most Westerners take for granted, namely, after judicious weighing of all the alternatives, Truman authorized an atomic attack in order to avoid an invasion of Japan, which, quote, Stimson was expected to cost over a million casualties to American forces alone. Now, Stimson knew as well as anyone that those numbers were wrong. The hypothetical counting of casualties is the subject of scholarly debate, but military estimates during the summer of 1945 concerned casualties in the thousands. Of course, Truman or any other American president might well have dropped the bomb to avoid 46,000 US casualties, the very highest figure that was estimated in 1945. Some may find this sort of calculation of body counts morally repellent in any case. Some of you will remember where Dostoevsky wrote that the death of one single child was too high a place, too high a price to pay for redemption. But those who care about truth will be appalled at the successive inflation of the number of American lives the bomb allegedly saved. By 1990, George Bush Sr. would speak of many millions by men who knew so much better. But even more appalling is the fact that Stimson knew that the speculation about any number of categories was pure, uh, casualties was purely hypothetical. For by the early summer of 1945, the majority of Truman's advisors believed that Japan was close to surrender. Both before and after the war, the highest ranking military officers, including Admiral Lee, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Eisenhower, Curtis LeMay, and many others, argued that neither an invasion nor the use of nuclear weapons was necessary to end the war. Japan was near collapse. The US military had blocked its ports and dominated its skies, preventing deliveries of badly needed raw materials. Most of its cities had been so severely devastated that Assistant Secretary of War John J. McCloy told his boss on June 17th there are no more cities to bomb, no more carriers to sink or battleships to bomb. We have difficulty finding targets. The surviving Japanese were starving. A continued American blockade alone would have likely ended the war by November. An American blockade and a declaration of war by the Soviet Union would have ended it even sooner. The full extent of Japan's ruin may have become clear only after the occupation, but the US had already broken its war code and knew that the Japanese ambassador to Moscow, unaware of the Yalta agreements, was desperately trying to move the Soviet Union to mediate a peace settlement. Only one condition stood in the way of surrender, Japan's insistence on keeping its emperor, whose status was considered to be almost divine. Uh, his voice was first heard by most Japanese when announcing the surrender on August 14th in a radio broadcast, and that was an event that many Japanese found more shocking than the bomb itself. And um, as you'll know, uh, or as most of you will know, of course, in the end, uh, after insisting on an unconditional surrender, the United States did agree to allow the emperor to, uh, for its own reasons, did allow the emperor to remain. But with the Nuremberg trials already in preparation, the prospect of seeing the emperor tried and hung would have strengthened crumbling Japanese morale and guaranteed a long and bloody invasion. On July 13th, the US had intercepted a cable from Japanese Foreign Minister Togo to Moscow asserting that it is his majesty's heart's desire to see the swift termination of the war as well as another that stated unconditional surrender is the only obstacle to peace. Truman was initially inclined to seek a face-saving formula which left the emperor on his throne under control of a US military administration, which uh, was indeed the formula that was accepted after it became clear that the US occupation would be much easier to administer if the emperor were there to order it. Much later, Stimson and McGeorge Bundy wrote that history might find the United States by its delay stating that position and the, the assurances concerning the emperor could have been made in June um, if their uh, interest was really in saving American lives. Uh, 
Stimson himself, during the crucial negotiations at Potsdam, was one of several uh, uh, advisors who advocated doing so. But there was a profound conflict between Stimson and a majority of Truman's advisors and the president's friend, James Burns. Jimmy Burns, as he was called, is one of those figures who's now forgotten by most people who aren't historians, but whose role in a host of mid-20th century evils was enormous. In 1953, the New York Post described him as the apostle of uncompromising white supremacy. That was when Eisenhower appointed him to uh, the UN Commission on Human Rights, showing just how serious uh, the Eisenhower administration was about enforcing human rights with the UN. Burns had actually hoped to become vice president himself in the 1944 election that elevated the obscure and inexperienced Harry Truman to power, but he was too racist and perhaps even more importantly too anti-union uh, to be nominated by the Democrats in those days. Truman's nomination was a last ditch effort to prevent the most popular candidate, Henry Wallace, from becoming vice president. Given that FDR died less than a year later, propelling the Democratic vice president to the presidency, it's painful to think how much history might have changed if the Democratic socialist anti-imperialist Wallace had prevailed. Instead, simply because he was too mild-mannered to offend anyone, the failed hat salesman from Missouri, Harry Truman, became, thanks to the Manhattan Project, about which he knew nothing when he assumed the presidency, the most powerful man in the world ever. It's sort of interesting to think, I mean, when, as we're tearing our hair out about the current occupant uh, of the White House, that the failed hat, hat salesman from Missouri um, might have run competition for um, mm, the least qualified person to ever live in that place. Uh, Truman's lack of experience or knowledge of foreign policy led him to depend heavily on Burns, whom he quickly appointed as Secretary of State. Burns showed his gratitude to Truman by quitting the cabinet and joining the racist Dixiecrats two years later. Burns accompanied Truman on the ship to the conference at Potsdam that had been called to discuss the final terms for ending the war. Despite the requests of both Churchill and Stalin, Truman insisted on postponing the conference that had um, originally scheduled for June in order to await the results of the first atomic test in New Mexico. By the time Truman and Burns' ship reached Potsdam, um, Burns' advice and the successful explosion at Alamogordo had convinced him that diplomatic negotiation with Japan and, even more importantly, the Soviet Union was unnecessary. Stimson and other advisors got to Potsdam by other routes, only to discover that the diplomatic plan they'd been diligently working on for the past month was suddenly canceled. The Potsdam Declaration, issued at the end of the conference, offered Japan a choice between unconditional surrender and complete destruction. Since the day of Pearl Harbor, the U.S. had pressed the Soviet Union to attack Japan, but in view of the enormous pressure on its western front, Stalin had insisted that the other allies open a second front against the Wehrmacht instead. By Yalta, Stalin had promised to invade Japan three months after the war in Europe had been ended. Although a major goal of the Potsdam Conference had originally been to assure that Stalin kept his promise, which he did exactly on August 9th, at Potsdam, the Soviet Union was not even asked to be a signatory to the declaration, leaving the Japanese to hope that the Soviet Union might maintain its neutrality. There were several scenarios to detonate the bomb in neutral space with witnesses to, so as to show the Japanese what might occur to detonate the bomb after sending out a warning to Japanese civilians in advance, or to do what was finally done. Burns convinced Truman to order a nuclear attack without prior warning, thus ending the war without Soviet involvement. Now, nearly every historian who studied the events of those crucial months agrees on this much. Some matters are still debated. 
uh, Rothblatt and Zillard, two of the scientists who worked on the bombs, reported being told that the real purpose of the bomb was to subdue the Soviets. Uh, information that, that led uh, Joseph Rothblatt to become the only scientist to actually leave the Manhattan Project. Uh, both Burns and Leslie Groves, the military director at Los Alamos, repeated such claims often enough um, that their truth isn't really in doubt. George Kennan urged Stimson and Bundy to delete the relevant passages of Stimson's autobiography, uh, which emphasized U.S. interest in intimidating the Russians. Kennan wrote, I quote, I'm afraid that if these statements were now to appear in an official biography of Mr. Stimson, a part of the reading public might conclude that the hope of influencing Russia by the threat of atomic attack had been, and probably remained, one of the permanently motivating elements of our foreign policy. Such an impression would play squarely into the hands of the communists who so frequently speak of our atomic policy, uh, dis diplomacy. Okay. Uh, end quote of Kennan. Um, some scholars point to political concerns. Would Congress create problems about the amount of funds that have been appropriated for the mysterious Manhattan Project if it didn't actually issue in something visible? Um, or was it the Russian declaration of war that led the Japanese to quickly press for better terms with the Americans Japanese military mem memos of those days focused more on the Soviet Union since the Soviets had killed their own emperor, but a few decades earlier, they could hardly be expected to spare Hirohito. If the question of why the bomb was dropped and what role it played in the timing of the surrender can still be disputed among some scholars, one answer can be absolutely ruled out. The bomb was not needed in order to avoid an American invasion. Nor was this a fact that had to be uncovered decades later through declassified documents or lost diaries, though those certainly helped to document it. In the fall of 1945, Truman ordered a team of investigators to conduct the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey to emphasize the effectiveness of U.S. bombing in ending the war. The investigators, led by such directors as Paul Nietzsche and John Kenneth Galbraith, concluded that even in Germany, the bombing caused less damage than it cost to inflict, and their conclusions about Japan were even more devastating. Um, quote, based on a detailed investigation of all the facts supported by the testimony, uh, it, Japan, it, it is the survey's opinion that certainly prior to December 31st, in all probability prior to November 1st, Japan would have surrendered even if atomic bombs had not been dropped, even if Russia had not entered the war, and even if no invasions had been planned or contemplated, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs did not defeat Japan, uh, nor by the testimony of en enemy leaders who ended the war did they persuade Japan to accept unconditional surrender." End quote. Now you might think the report was kept secret, but actually much of it was printed in the U.S. News and World Report. In the early days after the war, before controversy about the bomb had arisen, the idea that the bomb was not needed to end the war was so banal that Burns himself mentioned it at a press conference that resulted in a New York Times headline on August 31st, 1945, Japan beaten before atom bomb, Burns says. Um, Eisenhower described a meeting with Stimson just before the Potsdam Conference, quote, I'd been conscious of a feeling of depression, and so I voiced to him my grave misgivings. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's see, I'll, I'll skip some of these quotes. B believe me, they're all there. Just weeks after Hiroshima, Truman himself publicly declared that the bomb did not win the war. And Admiral Patrick Lee, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, wrote, it is my opinion that the use of this barbarous weapon was of no material success in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated. My own feeling was that in being the first to use it, we had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. Uh, Admiral Lee, um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, agreement that the bomb did not need to be dropped 
to end the war, crossed political borders at the time, uniting observers as utterly different as John Foster Dulles and Albert Einstein. In view of the commonness of this knowledge in 1945 and 1946, today's gap between the historians and general public opinion, even educated public opinion, is nearly as scandalous, I think, as the use of the bomb itself. Stimson's own doubts were expressed later. Quote, I've rarely been connected with a paper about which I have so much doubt at the last moment, Stimson told a friend. I think the full enumeration of the steps in the tragedy will excite horror among friends who heretofore thought me a kindly-minded Christian gentleman, but who will, after reading this, feel I am cold-blooded and cruel, end quote. But as James Conant had hoped, his article created a legend that fooled us sentimental educators to this day. 30 years ago, Michael Walter's eloquent classic, Just and Unjust Wars, would make a moral argument that it was wrong to drop the bomb using many of the same grounds that Rawls cited later. But Walter's source for the historical events that led to dropping the bomb was an article called The Decision to Use the Bomb, which he quotes widely, namely the Harper's article authored by Henry Stimson. And just to show you um, how widespread and how influential the article still is, a year ago, um, Harper's decided to reprint the original article and to ask five writers to comment on the bomb, on the decision to use the bomb, um, which is actually uh, where we found um, uh, Mohammed's uh, piece, which is one of the five writers who was asked to comment on the bomb. This is what Harper's printed December uh, 2017, um, before the five different writers. In February 1947, Harper's Magazine published Henry L. Stimson's The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb. As Secretary of War, Stimson had served as the Chief Military Advisor to President Truman and recommended the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No, he didn't. The terms of his unrepentant apologia, an excerpt of which appears on page 35, are now familiar to us. The risk of a dud made a demonstration too risky. The human cost of a land invasion would be too high. Nothing short of the bomb's awesome lethality would compel Japan to surrender. The bomb was the only option. Seventy years later, we find his reasoning unconvincing. Entirely aside from the destruction of the blast themselves, the decision thrust the world irrevocably into a high-stakes arms race in which, as Stimson took care to warn, the technology would proliferate, evolve, quite possibly lead to the end of modern civilization. So even among people who are concerned about this, uh, the uh, fact that Stimson's article was as false as it was influential uh, seems to be unknown. And as Louis Menand wrote, what's extraordinary about Conant's construction of the Stimson article, and um, researchers have traced the correspondence between Conant and Stimson, Conant was heavily involved in, no, Henry, you know, change this and put in a paragraph about that. Uh, Menand wrote, what's extraordinary is not that a statesman should wish to fix the record most favorably on himself. What is remarkable is that the president of the country's leading institution of liberal learning, having set in motion a process leading to the publication of the facts about an event should intervene in order to censor details, he judged it undesirable for the public to learn." Um, end quote. Now, 50 years after John Foster Dulles and Albert Einstein agreed on presumably the only thing they ever agreed on, the National Air and Space Museum, flagship of the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, and the most visited museum in the world, strangely enough, it surprised me to find out this little factoid, uh, was also planning an exhibit to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the war's end. The centerpiece of the exhibit was to be the restored body of the Enola Gay, the B-29 that had dropped the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. Director Martin Harwood wanted to surround the plane with an exhibit which, as he said, would 
neither glorify nor apologize for the bomb, but explore it. That was too much for the critics, who had been leaked a copy of internal memos by someone within the museum. They criticized the fact that more than half the photographs of j dead Japanese were women and children. They objected to the inclusion of a schoolgirl's charred lunchbox. The museum used the figure of 30,000 to 50,000 American lives potentially saved by the bomb. Veterans insisted on using the official estimates of half a million to a million. Mostly the critics complained that only Japanese and not American victims were depicted without suggesting how it could be different in an exhibit may, meant to center on the Enola Gay. As the curator, Crunch, later put it, I think what fundamentally bothers people about the show is that it attempts to tell the fullest story possible. In other words, it doesn't end when the bomb leaves the bomb bay. So under pressure from various groups, Harwit revised the original plans. He proposed to begin with a section on Japanese war crimes. Veterans, Republican politicians, and rightward-leaning media all had interests in criticizing the exhibit, but the major catalyst for the criticism was the Air Force Association, which describes itself as a veterans organization. But, and I'm quoting uh, from Robert Lifton's book about the subject. The AFA is in fact the air wing of what Dwight Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. It was founded in 1946 to lobby for the creation of an independent air force to fight post-war budget cutbacks and to keep our country rigorously aroused to the urgent importance of air power. That is, the Air Force Association is in that sense um, like the National Rifle Association. Um, it has uh, about as much reference, uh, uh, relevance to Air Force veterans, which it closes, as the NRA does to uh, rifle owners. But besides the AFA, the media chimed in. The Wall Street Journal had no qualms about printing editorials that spoke of diabolical revisionists. The Washington Post wrote of the zealots of academe who prowl liberal arts departments muttering against American imperialism. Even the New York Times, which had voiced some concerns about censorship, felt compelled to smear the exhibit's creators as ideological idiots with a cartoon depicting the Enola Gay bearing the, level, the label built by oppressed female workers and piloted by the white male establishment, New York Times. So all these forces uh, fought to stop the exhibit as it was originally planned. As media grew increasingly virulent, Harwit dismissed as absolute nonsense the Air Force historian's charge that the museum was, quote, still pushing the thesis that the atom bomb shouldn't have been dropped. In fact, as I showed you, that thesis was held by most of Truman's advisors. But even raising the question of whether the bomb should have been dropped was enough to get Harwick called to Capitol Hill, where the Republican majority in Congress assured that a resolution was passed unanimously condemning the exhibit as revisionist, unbalanced, and offensive, and threatened to withdraw the Smithsonian's funding. Harwit revised yet again, expanding the, session, the section on Japanese wartime cruelty, deleting many photographs of dead and wounded Japanese, as well as the statement that the decision to bomb Hiroshima has, quote, sparked controversy over the years. I hope at the time that someone appreciated the irony in the midst of the biggest controversy in the history of the Smithsonian, the very mention of controversy was deemed too controversial. Orwell couldn't have imagined a better form of repression. Harwood and his curators were dismissed as part of the anti-Vietnam generation, uh, people who obviously hate this country and shouldn't be working here. The Canadian curator was suspect because he'd studied in Calgary at a time when Americans were fleeing to Canada to escape the draft. And the exhibit as a whole was 
condemned as close to treason. The only solution which the veterans, their congressional allies, and finally the Smithsonian's board uh, could all embrace, get rid of the casualty debate, the victims, and all other potentially troubling uh, questions, and keep the plane, which was, in the end, the solution that prevailed. Um, Harwit resigned. He lost because the problems raised by the exhibit were not merely historical, and I quote, the discovery of an unknown perspective so fundamentally at odds with the orthodox formulation could be sufficient to legitimize a critical reassessment not only of the bombing of Hiroshima, but America's continued reliance on nuclear deterrence and key assumptions about the origins of the Cold War. So it's, um, it's not surprising that there was a nonpartisan agreement on um, the cancellation of the exhibit. Uh, Clinton was president at the time. Mm. And the editors of the excellent collection, uh, the book that documents this entire debate, wrote, the attempt at censorship and the cancellation will stand as one of the great intellectual scandals of American history. But as a matter of fact, 20 years later, most American intellectuals have forgotten it. The media fallout had a very short half-life. Um, for comparison, um, but this is another subject, all this took place at the time when the Hamburger Institute for Sozialforschung was planning the Wehrmacht Ausstellung, which had a very different outcome. Um, let me just... I don't know, how much time do I have? Not much. All right, do I have 10 minutes? <laughs> okay, um, fine. I wanna um, just look a little bit at um, the kinds of arguments that get cited when people want to avoid the business of confronting their own nation's crimes. Um, the first is to cite force majeure to insist that extraordinary circumstances overwhelmed other moral obligations. Um, so by uh, continuing to exist that the bomb saved lives that would otherwise have been lost, Stimson and Truman not only appealed to force majeure, but they put the bomb in the realm of virtue rather than crime. Uh, and the continued inflation of the number of lives saved, it was only a quarter of a million when Truman was in the White House, but uh, a half a million by the time he left it, and as we saw many millions when George Bush Sr. was there, was a way of inflating the m morality of the bombing, the more lives saved, the greater the virtue. Perhaps it's no surprise that uh, after decades of such propaganda, for so we must call it, a U.S. congressman could write to the secretary of the Smithsonian in the midst of the exhibit debate and write, quote, there is no excuse for an exhibit which addresses one of the most morally unambiguous events of the 20th century. Morally unambiguous events of the 20th century. Okay. Um, second way of avoiding responsibility for national crimes is to insist on one's own victimization. Uh, so criticism of the d decision to drop the bomb could be met by reference to the Bataan Death March or other Japanese war crimes, which criticisms of the exhibit insisted on including and continuing uh, to expand. More interesting, perhaps, is another kind of strategy to deflect attention from national crimes, namely to uh, attending to the moral goodness or at least the ordinary decency of the people responsible for them. And it's striking how even American thinkers who criticized Truman's decision to drop the bomb rushed to assure their leaders that apart from this decision, Truman was a good man and a good president. Um, now, as a matter of political principle, it's probably always a good idea to avoid demonizing your opponents, but the insistence on the goodness of Harry Truman's character is puzzling. Um, 
Even Lifton and Mitchell's book, Hiroshima and America, which I recommend to anybody who hasn't uh, read it, uh, insists on praising Truman, quoting them now, Harry S. Truman was a good man, a loving man, who made a decision to use the cruelest weapon in human history on a heavily populated city, and then spent much of his remaining years defending that decision. Now, several facts presented by Lifton Mitchell themselves raise questions about Truman's goodness. Uh, his reported exuberance while making the announcement that the bomb had been dropped, after which he attended, he was on ship coming back from Potsdam, uh, he attended a comedy review, quote, belly laughing at the entertainment. His declaration that he never lost a moment's sleep over the decision. His description of Oppenheimer as the crybaby scientist after Oppenheimer visited him in late 1945 to urge the need for international control of nuclear weapons with the words, Mr. President, I have blood on my hands. Um, or his joke at the Washington Gridiron Dinner about appointing a Secretary of Reaction. What a load he'll take off my mind if he'll put the atom bomb, if he'll put the atom back together so it can't be broken up. There are other reasons to question the uh, goodness of Harry Truman, though he's often praised for desegregating the army, for which at the time he was heavily criticized by Burns and his ilk. The historian Carol Anderson has shown that he did so only after the NAACP threatened to urge black voters to abandon the Democrats in the very close 1948 election unless the f party finally did something to improve race relations. Once safely in office, he dragged his feet on implementing every civil rights policy, including refusing to support a bill making lynching a federal crime. When I first read about this in a biography of Albert Einstein, who was too ill at the time to come to the White House, but sent a letter along with a delegation of clergymen to urge support for a federal bill, I was puzzled. Um, lynching is murder, of course, so wasn't it illegal already? The answer is, well, yes, but since the law could never be enforced in southern states where sheriffs were routinely involved in lynching, um, it, a federal bill had been urged since 1920. Uh, in fact, in drafting the Bill of Human Rights that went to the United Nations, Americans made sure to include a clause that said murder, among other things, would only be prosecutable by states in order to prevent Southern politicians from challenging any attempt to put human rights in the forefront of international law. In view of all this, it's puzzling that as critical a writer as Robert J. Lifton feels bound to insist that Truman was a good man. Um, I'm not sure what he means. Uh, was he nice to his wife or his dog? Um, to be sure, there are people who uh, argue that the fact that uh, Donald Trump has never had a dog is clue to his character. I don't know. The suppression of facts about Hiroshima has had more of an impact on our moral perception than we know how to acknowledge. Lifton Mitchell wrote that Americans, even if they don't know the facts, have a vague, unfelt half-knowledge of Hiroshima that, and I quote them, increased ordinary American sense of being out of control of their own destiny of being out of control of the large forces that determine their future. We have to ask ourselves how much of our rising mistrust for politicians and officials of all kinds, for our government and just about all who govern us, how much this angry cynicism so evident in our public life in recent years is an outcome of the Hiroshima and post-Hiroshima nuclear deceptions and concealments. Uh, that quote is from 1995. Uh, I want to close with a couple of personal remarks. I uh, began this essay with criticisms of two philosophers from whom I learned a great deal uh, myself, and it gives me no pleasure at all to attack them. Uh, where I do so, it's from the need to attack the profession of philosophy itself from its disinterest in the empirical world. Perhaps no surprise, given the room that proving the existence of that world has taken on the philosophical stage these past hundred years. 
Still, it was disappointing that two of the finest moral theorists of the 20th century, who in fact knew and cared a great deal about many events in history, failed to question official US justification of de the uh, uh, US decision to drop the bomb, even as they were condemning that decision itself. This seems to me a reflection of philosophy's general tendency to abstraction, but also of moral philosophy's emphasis on the ought as opposed to the is. While I hold this to be the most important distinction we ever draw, Hume's claim that we cannot derive ought from is is only technically correct. Hiroshima may show that we can derive an ought, or at least an ought not, from an is. If you put enough facts together, they may be sufficient condemnation alone. Um, I wish I could say that the ignorance was just a, a function of philosophy's feelings, but as I was working on the subject, I was so outraged that uh, I talked to a large number of highly educated and critical people from many countries, only to find that they were as clueless as I had been. Uh, one person compared the suppression of facts about Hiroshima to the sort of Soviet propaganda we rightly criticize. Alas, there is a difference, as um, Misha Gavovich put it when I was going on to virtually everybody I met for a few months at the time. Uh, Misha said, Soviet intellectuals knew when propaganda was propaganda. American and many other Western intellectuals do not. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, you know, we've talked about this before. I, I've heard that, but I mean. Anybody who knew me. I, 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 I did most of this work about three years ago, and I was so uh, uh, upset and appalled that, yeah, I, anybody I ran across, um, I sort of, you know, right. those were the, do I, you know? Right, and I mean, uh, and it, you know, it, at the time, and, I mean, when I was a kid, I remember my father. Because it's one of these questions that I think kids naturally, I mean, especially as an American, why did this, you know, and, you know, my dad, who was born after the war, you know, he had internalized the same rationale, you know, and it, it, it kind of made sense to me as a kid, you know, it, sort of, it was enough to stop my questioning, but then to find out many years later, you know. Um, but what, what I have to say, is, yeah. I mean, just, just to sort of, I don't, not but I tend to think that Lorraine Daston knows almost everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she she's uh, one of the more broad and erudite people I know. Um, Rainey was shocked. And she's done research, serious research, and co-edited a book on mm -hmm. um, the kind of topic that she was talking about before, but about the actual decision to drop the bomb. Mm -hmm. um, she was surprised by this information. Do you want, uh, but sorry, did I interrupt you? Were you going to ask a question? No, I, I was just wondering whether um, you thought that this blind spot, this huge blind spot, um, not only among people in the U U.S., but also in the rest of the world about this decision, if, if shedding light on it could kind of also shed light back on the nuclear threat itself. I mean, if if we can't get to it through, because we're so preoccupied now with all the other things wrong in the world. I just wonder if, if this form of actually looking far back into the past may be a way of getting a clearer view of the present, um, in your opinion. It's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure that it does. I think it sheds a lot of light on post-war, um, post-war international mm -hmm. politics and relations. Um, and uh, a Russian woman I know said, you know, of course highly critical as I believe, you know, we're, well, most people who grew up during the Soviet Union uh, are of its government said, uh, you know, we grew up that we never forgot the fact that it was one country in the world mm 
that uh, actually deployed nuclear weapons. So does it highlight something about nuclear weapons now? I'm not sure. I don't, yeah. have, a, yeah. I don't have a clear answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, other questions from uh, Robert? Yeah, no, right. yeah. uh, excellent, excellent talk, Susan. Um, bef before Stimson's article appeared in 1947, uh, in 1946, John Hersey published Hiroshima. And that was an eye-opener for a lot of people. And in fact, that probably, probably set the, the liberal conservative dichotomy right there. That's what Conan yeah. said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a reaction to that, yeah. Um, I agree with Michael Walter that in, once we, once the Japanese lost Saipan, Saipan in 1944, that the American war against Japan became a war of aggression, culminating in Hiroshima, which was a war crime, no question. But the, the, the interesting thing to do is, is Hiroshima was also a preview of World War III. For five days, Japan experienced World War III. That was something, I think, in my own mind, I go back and forth on this, but I think to counterpose the, the war crime part of Hiroshima, you have to look at Hiroshima as a demonstration of what World War III meant. And, and I think in many respects, Hiroshima has, in fact, saved the rest of this planet from going up the same way. I, I think the effects of the bomb, the effects of the bomb, you always hear about this in, in 44, 40 to 46, what the effects of the bomb. The effects of the bomb, I believe, now in the 21st century have run out. We are far enough away now, we're 75 years, almost 75 years away from Hiroshima now, where, where the, that, that impact, that, that fierce consciousness, world global consciousness of what can happen to all of us, that has eroded to the point now where I think uh, it's, it's, we're back in, in sense, we're back to square one. Uh, just, a, just a comment. I trust you're not suggesting that another <laughs> bomb might, you know, wake us up again. Um, well, I know. Uh, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, I was also reminded of a more recent sort of events with Obama going to Hiroshima and how there was a lot of debate whether he should apologize and I think that the outcome was he uh, gave sympathy but there was no Formal apology. He was attacked for even going. It was the first American exactly. president ever to visit. Yeah. And I was just curious whether you know you've looked at that you know a more recent event um, where we have an incredibly you know what is considered a, a, a liberal progressive president trying to reckon with national crimes of the past and how even today or you know just several years ago it's just still the same uh, debates are, are playing out. So. Well, I actually just wrote a book that's clocking in at 554 manuscript pages on the subject. So, um, <laughs> although it doesn't even get to Hiroshima, it's mostly talking about racism. Um, so I have a lot to say that I, that I won't um, say right now. What I, what I found most troubling, however, about this research and, you know, which case it may just be blind optimism that, that sent me off to spend three years, um, you know, kind of working on the subject, um, is how easily crimes get buried. I mean, what, what's a shame? It would be one thing if there were some kind of, there'd been some kind of evidence at the time, except for the fears of GIs. I mean, GIs were indeed afraid of uh, a land invasion, uh, you know, given, um, given the ferocity of the war in the Pacific. But GIs on the ground have no idea what's going on, of course. So, 
if there were evidence that you know uh, you know the entire uh, Japanese empire was going to go kamikaze and and you know the a land invasion if there were any evidence for this fact and that you suddenly discovered at some point later oh my god here are all these secret classified papers that actually they didn't need to drop the bomb. That would be one story. It would still be disturbing, um, but not nearly as disturbing as the fact that for a good year and a half after the war, uh, after the bomb was dropped, no one made that argument at all. Um, and the argument then gets deliberately constructed by the president of Harvard uh, uh, using the former Secretary of War, and then 50 years later to commemorate the thing, all of that has been entirely forgotten. I mean, just you, nobody, during the, the, um, the Smithsonian exhibit that wasn't, apparently, Nobody thought to look up, I mean, it's New York Times headlines. Nobody thought to go and look up the newsprint. Um, the New York Times didn't bother to look up its own archives, you know? And, and that I find so depressing for anybody who is trying to be in the business of enlightenment, um, that you might have a, you know, a, a burst of knowledge and a fairly small effort. I mean, this was, you know, one article in Harper's, right, could, could set in motion a myth that uh, is, is still believed by a large portion of uh, people in the globe. It's yeah. Another question for me. Hi, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, as somebody at the Smithsonian, I've become very uh, familiar with the Enola Gay controversy. I think you would actually be tickled to, to know that um, whenever at the Smithsonian any kind of potential controversial exhibition comes up, the quote is, well, we don't want another That's Enola Gay, Gay situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, completely not referencing the actual Enola Gay, but the exhibition itself. Um, I, I guess while, while you were talking um, about this uh, rewriting of history um, and and how even the institution that uh, the public uh, tells itself that it, it trusts to sort of be a moral or a historical compass um, can be swayed by public opinion. Um, I thought about how uh, in my growing up I uh, over the course of the last 20-30 years saw how uh, I could I could go to school and learn that uh, Columbus discovered America, <laughs> learned that Thanksgiving was uh, just like a happy dinner party, yet because of uh, social media and the ability for, for some of these really old historical myths to be uh, in, in effectively debunked to the point where um, you know, you, you go on Twitter and Instagram on, on Thanksgiving and you'll find almost as present of a hashtag for Indigenous Remembrance Day as they would for Thanksgiving and, and things like that. And so I wonder, um, do you feel like given that the Enola Gay situation was in the 90s, prior to social media and prior to this movement, that, that now there might be some sort of opening for uh, for this for, for this to resurface. I'm, I'm saying this uh, considering that, for example, just, just recently, you know, uh, within the last week, there have been uh, Twitter, uh, tw Twitter outrage around the, the rediscovery of the fact that that Life magazine cover of the soldier kissing the woman was actually uh, a, a guy who forced a woman, a stranger woman to kiss him, and uh, that John Wayne uh, was incredibly uh, homophobic and racist in a re-emerge Playboy interview. So is, is there opportunities for something like this to, to have its day in court again? So at the risk of sounding entirely anachronistic, um, I, my problems with social media are, are serious enough so that I don't use it at all, and I got both of those stories right away. 
Um, so the idea that you need social media to come up with alternative points of view, I mean, perhaps they wouldn't have been in, I don't know, the Post or the uh, Salon Doc, or any, you know, I, I look at a variety of, of, um, of internet more or less traditional news sources every day and looking at um, a, you know, a fair variety in a couple of different countries. I'm actually pretty well informed and my friends in social media will come and say, no, no, I'm saying, yeah, that way I go, oh, you know, if it's, if, it, if it's big enough on social media, it goes viral and then the regular media picks it up. I'm just not sure, again, that social media is the answered given that we all know, you know, I, I, I would have loved to believe in the existence of a great, you know, emerging democratic force, but um, it wouldn't be original for me to right now to point out the, you know, the, the ways in which so, social media has not been a force for the good. I mean, once again, I was quoting you New York Times headlines, right? You cannot get more traditional media than that. And um, what I find so disturbing, and I've now been paying attention to this on a number of different stories, um, is the way in which legends get built, if someone wants to build them, you know, and it's not even about events that were 50 years ago or 70 years ago or, or whatever, it's events that are a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, to, to take my favorite example, um, the movement to welcome a million refugees in Germany was an absolutely popular movement that um, Angela Merkel spent 12 days, as is her usual, um, you know, want, waiting to see which way the political wind is blowing before she took any kind of a position on it. Um, yet all over the world, Angela Merkel, and, and it was this tremendous, very moving outpouring from um, all different segments of society across many places in Germany, um, that at that point the political wind was blowing in the direction for her to say, okay, we'll do it, we'll figure it out. Um, but all over the world, she's been hailed or condemned, depending on which political position you stand for, um, as you know, the generous person who opened her arms to the refugees, that was a popular from the ground up movement. And even in Germany, um, you know, it, that's a fact that somehow disappeared, but like we were all here, it was, you know, I mean, everybody, because you have signs on my pharmacy window, I'm collecting food for refugees. Ver the people in Berlin did so much that there was a point at which um, organizations were saying, we don't need any more volunteers, don't bring us any more food. I mean, <laughs> you know. Um, so, in short, I don't, I'm, I'm really skeptical that we need social media in order to pay attention and in particular to remember um, what's actually going on in the news. Any further questions for Susan? Okay, then. I, actually, oh. can I ask a question? <laughs> Forgot to ask you, sorry. I would ask a question <laughs> to the audience. Um, who knew this story already? Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Martin, did you know it before I was going on about it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move right on with, okay, just a two-minute two break just for some tech setup. Okay. <laughs>